Welcome to the Agents Angle, looking into the world of football agents and this week attempting to find out if the stories and figures relating to the football agents industry really do add up. With me, Jonathan Booker. And me, Peter Paleologos. On the Agents Angle this week, we are joined by one of the most well-known names, voices and faces from the world of football finance to examine money matters relating to football agents and whether some claims and perception agents and football finances are justified or are founded. We also look at what seems to be a growing dependency on agents when it comes to managers and coaches and ask whether this is an increasingly unhealthy trend for the football industry following increased media coverage on the topic and changes to licensed agent regulations. All that to come on this episode of The Agents Angle. And as many football seasons for 2023-2024 draw to a close around the world, another season is starting to gain momentum. And that is what many affectionately refer to as the silly season. With transfer speculation and rumours increasing from the hopeful through to the sublime and the ridiculous. Plus it seems the managerial merry-go-round may well be more intriguing this off-season than it has been in the past. Both of which will mean that agents will be busy and many of the more well-known agent names will be featured in the media, along with those loud voices offering their opinions whether qualified or not. Yes, Jonathan, I think already we've seen huge coverage in terms of the managerial or coaches space very much across Europe and across a lot of big clubs because there are vacancies and speculation about coaches and positions. I think the next three months will be very interesting regarding what happens with not just coaches and managers, but also their style of play and how they're going to fit into new structures within some of the football clubs. Recently, I've also seen a lot of football departments and football directors implement more strategic systems in the way they want to see or appoint coaches in terms of how they run the football department and what they want from their managers or coaches. There's been also media focus on these football directors. I recall actually a colleague who posted who stated that some football directors are the new superstars in the football business and they prefer to work now with upcoming elite coaches, younger coaches, and maybe overlook experienced coaches. That's an interesting trend. They don't want big egos, but they want coaches with an effective methodology and game plan. But coaches now are very important. I just looked at a figure the other day that there's some big money involved in recruiting coaches. It's speculated that Pep Guardiola is on 20 million at Manchester City, Arteta nine and a half, Emery at Aston Villa about eight. And there's a few others as well, um, including our own Australian Ange Postacoglu around about five million pounds a year. Now, we talk about agents here, and now the client base of agents is not just players, it is coaches. And a lot of big agents want to represent top managers and place them in clubs. And it comes down to what I call the compelling three times service offering that the best agents crave is to have influence at the club by representing the manager, having some players at the club, and if successful, have future transfer opportunities for them. But as I said, Peter, it, it just seems to me it's just a bit busier than normal. It might just be a coincidence this year. But with that, the mention of agents and their influence over particular clubs with player transfers through their relationships with managers and coaches, or even the mention of agents handling the recruitment of managers and coaches for clubs seems to have increased. And arguably, they're able to exercise more influence on the football transfer market. And that is a distinct possibility. And with that, there's a selection of headlines I'm just going to go through. I'm not going to go through the articles themselves that have come to the fore over the last month or so involving three of the biggest names in the agent world. The first headline is Arsenal could now sign special striker target for just 34 million, thanks to Keir Jarabjin. Then we've got George Mendes' plan for Milan with Conceição, plus two valuable players. And then we've got another one. Football super agent Mendes preparing 292 million euro double deal for Man United. And again, Georges Mendes, arguably the biggest agent in the world now. And then influence of football agent George Mendes will play a huge part in any transfers being signed and sealed. And that involves West Ham, 
and Gillian Lopetegui, who has been appointed at West Ham now, formerly of Wolves. And of course, there's a connection there between Wolves, Lopetegui, Mendes. And the final one is again referring to West Ham and their search for a manager. Super agent Pini Zahavi speaking to West Ham about £20.5 million deal for new boss claim sources. And those latter two stories, as I said, relate to the same club in being West Ham. So obviously one was going to end up being wider the mark. And to reaffirm that, elsewhere there were reports of another well-known agent, Will Salthouse of Unique Sports Group, being involved with West Ham in the recruitment of their new manager. So it's unclear which agent helped secure Julian Lopetegui for West Ham. Maybe it was a combination of agents one for the club and one for the manager, as in the case of many player signings. But for every headline like these that has credibility, there are probably five, ten or even more that don't. Whether they're based on the hopes and fears of fan websites, and a lot of the speculation does come from fan websites, or media speculation, or even a story planted by an agent with a friendly journalist. It's not unknown to happen. Yet at this point, we should refer back to our favourite four letters, FFAR and the FIFA football agent regulations, which of course now dictate that only FIFA licensed agents are permitted to represent coaches and managers, as well as players. That is, unless that element of the FFAR is now suspended as well by the time this episode goes live. I think these headlines also signify that if you've got a brand as an agent and you're active and you've got big name coaches and big name players, you're going to be in the headlines because you're going to make noise and say these deals may happen. It also signifies that if you've got the right top player or right top coach as an agent, clubs need to deal with you. So you're in their ear, you have influence. Now you mentioned the FFAR. I'm also going to say the RSTP. Coaches now are covered there, especially if they're not paid by clubs. They can take action there. Now, many coaches rely on the power of agents to get jobs because there's a scarcity. However, the strategy for coaches and representing coaches is very different in order to get that job. Agents have to do a lot of pre-work, put CV to clubs before even maybe a position arises or vacancy arises. So it's a different strategy by an agent, in my opinion, because you don't have variables as well, like training compensation, solidarity contribution, like you do with players. You don't have transfer clauses as much. But what you do have is gardening leave if they leave, if they're a top coach, a release fee if they need to leave early. So these are things you need to negotiate. Now, in terms of agents, you've got to have influence within football departments or presidents, especially in Asia, influence with presidents to place coaches. In Europe, it seems to be more based on the game model where you need influence within the football department to have the right coach who can execute what the club wants. And I know in South America, agents do have a lot of influence on club and so coaches. So it's an important space. Now, I had a look at those articles you mentioned. And it's interesting the terminology used and how people like Mendes or Jurapchian have. It mentions the Portuguese super agent, which refers to Mendes, is spearheading the operation to bolster United's attacking options. That's the kind of wording we have here and the power of these agents, that basically they have a lot of influence in the upcoming summer transfer window. And then with Jurapchian, he had some power, it's mentioned in the article, over Arsenal's transfer business in the early days of Mikel Arteta's reign at the club. And it may be speculation or, as you mentioned, a friendly journalist, but it does indicate for me that powerful agents like Mendes have influence and are go-to agents for a lot of these clubs in reshaping their squads or looking for that unique coach to take them to a title or to a Champions League's place or whatever their ambition is, Jonathan. But it's totally understandable the concerns that some people have with regards to agents having increasing influence over certain managers and clubs and ultimately the transfer market. Personally, I don't think it's anything new. Agents have long had close associations with specific managers, coaches, club owners and directors, and no doubt some of those have been questionable associations and grounds for an unhealthy conflict of interest, really. But I was speaking to somebody who was at the LMA, the League Managers Association, the annual dinner, and they actually commented the number of coaches and managers who were in the room who were quite clearly out of work. 
So when they build that bond with an agent who's able to get them a position in the industry, when so many others are out of work, it's understandable that that bond is strengthened and they work together. The interesting thing is whether these relationships are going to receive increased scrutiny from the football authorities, such as FIFA, or whether the additions for the licensed manager and coach representation under FFAR are just a token gesture. Plus, with the capping element of FFAR still in place in several jurisdictions, we have to consider whether the 10% variation for agents acting for the selling club shifts the dynamic of such associations between managers or clubs and those with agents. But those clubs who don't cultivate such relationships with the bigger agents and agencies may find their recruitment options diminished for not just players, but the managers and coaches themselves. Simple fact is, most agents will either go for the most lucrative offer, whether it is in the short or long term, and that is the most lucrative offer for them and or their clients. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most significant considerations looking at the lucrative offer. But I do believe agents, and I'm hearing it a lot amongst the bigger agents and the agencies and the coaches, it's about the project as well. So that terminology, the project, what we're going to do with this club, has also come into the arena of when I negotiate a contract, where we're going with this club and what the ambitions are, what the budgets are. In terms of the agent's influence, They have a big influence, especially the bigger ranges on the club's transfer policy. And clubs are looking at a lot of the top agents who can broker deals, who can string a deal together, a very difficult deal to get over the line. And it's not just the big five leagues. We see in other leagues that there are one or two top agents who deal with clubs because there's not that many jobs in the top five leagues for coaches. So if you've got top managers who've been maybe at a certain league, they might look at other markets. I know that some major coaches have been placed in markets like Greece, Turkey, Switzerland, Austria. So it's not just the big five markets to create opportunities for elite coaches. The other thing is with coaches, you've got to look at the entourage effect where an agent also has to pretty much negotiate, not just for the coach, but maybe they may have a couple of staff members they want to bring along. How does that work? They want to bring a team of staff, you know, assistants, trainers, even physios. They want to say, I'll come, but I need these four people with me, especially assistant coaches. It's a different set of negotiation skills for an agent. And who's their client? Is it the coach themselves or is it all the staff that they're trying to bring along? An agent, when representing a coach, has to look at all these things. It's a different type of representation. And we know under the regs, the coaches are our clients, but we have to look at it as a different strategy and a different offering compared to, say, the player deal. And with that, such service fees and commissions to agents, whether representing the club, the manager or a player, have to be taken into account by the club when it comes to cost controls financial fair play, salary caps, profit and sustainability in various leagues and competitions around the world. But on the topic of money and finance in football, who can we possibly turn to for an insight? And in particular, on those aspects relating to the football agent industry. And our guest today is recognised by many as the face and voice that provides an insight into what is really happening in the world of football finances. With a no fear nor favour approach, similar to ourselves, I hope, that has led to him become the scourge of many a wrongan in the football business, co-host on the incredibly popular Price of Football podcast, which has since 2019 racked up more than 500 episodes. Whoever would have thought it, when after five episodes, they even invited an unsightly agent onto their show, mentioning no names. He is, of course, the Baron of Brighton, the Sultan of Spreadsheets, and Liverpool University's esteemed expert on all things relating to football finance. Kieran Maguire. Kieran, welcome to the Agents Angle. Well, I'm going to get you doing this for my live shows, Jonathan. That was, that was an introduction and a half. I'm, I'm absolutely tickety-boo, irritatingly cheerful as always. That's great to hear. So to start, the widely used mantra of money leaving football when it comes to agents. What would be your immediate professional response to that mantra in terms of the past, the present and the future? I find it rather strange. 
Um, for people not aware of my background, I, I used to be a chartered accountant. I specialised in insolvency. We would be uh, selling companies that had gone into administration. And the first thing I'd always do is I would appoint an agent to market the company, to filter some of the lunatics away from me having to deal with them. And they would get a commission. Um, I'm an author. I've got an agent who negotiated an advance for me. I didn't even know you get an advance from a publisher. So I was more than happy to pay them a commission. And I find it bizarre, but it's also very populist. And, and football is an incredibly populist industry. I, I work with a stand-up comedian he's, who's worked all of his life in the entertainment industry. And they've all got agents. And what I find very strange is that when I talk to footballers, when I talk to football managers, they all have agents. And very rarely are they the people complaining. It tends to be people on the outside who don't necessarily have a familiarity with the nuances of the industry and they don't see the benefits of agency work. They just see a financial cost and it's easy pickings. Um, certainly a couple of deals, which are always referred to, you know, the Paul Pogba deal, for example, the agent's fee there was very high, but nobody forced the two clubs involved to pay that fee. So presumably, if they were that unhappy, they wouldn't have gone ahead with the deal. And on that topic, the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino, recently bemoaned that agent fees had a negative impact on the monies redistributed to training clubs through FIFA's training compensation and solidarity mechanisms. In your expert opinion, is it correct to draw such a comparison? Because to many, that is seemingly not the case. Yeah, if, if I drew a Venn diagram of agents representing their clients and FIFA training compensation, there's no overlap. Um, Infantino likes to sideline topics because that means that there's less focus on empire building and the lack of democracy within FIFA itself. So again, what you are seeing here is a classic example of throwing a dead cat into a, a discussion. So Jenny, uh, you've just increased the number of committees at FIFA from seven to 35 and everybody attending those committees is getting a daily fee and five-star hotels and business travel to when the meetings are taking place. And that looks very much like you're just looking after your mates and your mates are looking after you. So let's divert this by painting agents as the big bad wolves of football. I don't get it. You know, I, I'm a professional person in my own industry, you know, education and also the world of finance. The vast majority of my colleagues are good. There are some absolute scoundrels. And that goes for the football industry, including owners, including players, including managers and including agents. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily any worse or better than other aspects of the profession. Now, we were both called as expert witnesses at CAS, Court of Arbitration for Sport, and that was in the case between PROFA and FIFA over the FFAR, the infamous FIFA football agent regulations. And that hearing was a while back now. But from knowing you and the research and analysis that you do, I get the feeling that only a fraction of your research and evidence was actually heard at CAS on agents and associated finances primarily because you can only answer the questions posed to you in such a hearing. So with that in mind, from a financial perspective, what are the main points you would make almost in substantiating FIFA's case in favour of FFAR? And from the agent side, what are the main points you would make that strengthen the agent's arguments against FFAR? Um, I think from FIFA's position, the angle I would be going at would be that the cap that they were proposing. That would still allow agents to earn a living from elite players. And therefore, that would mean that all of the parties could be kept happy. Um, I would also argue that because football is such a talent industry, there's not an issue in terms of trying to persuade people to move from Club X to Club Y. And therefore, there's no reason why the players could not do that themselves, uh, perhaps with a bit of assistance from FIFA themselves. Uh, who knows? Um, so I think those would be the, the arguments I would be putting forward in the case of FIFA. And, and perhaps the third one would be that the overall quantum of agents' fees is excessive. You know, we saw when the Football Association published the agents' totals for the 2023 season, um, it was, what, £400 million for an industry 
which has got total revenues of six billion, you know, that's working out as what six seven percent. Um, could that money be spent elsewhere? It, it could, you know, but then uh, chief executives' pay could be spent elsewhere as well. So that would be the, the position I would take from FIFA's perspective. Um, from the agent side, you're not holding a gun to people's heads. Um, you know, you quote a fee. If the clubs don't like that fee, then they're perfectly entitled to walk away. There are always other players who clubs might be attracted to. If the player is desperate to move from club X to club Y, yep, compromises can always be made on all parties' side. And you don't see the same focus on agents in other sports. So you know, Tiger Woods has an agent, Roger Federer has an agent. They all do their jobs. Anton Deck have agents in the entertainment industry. And there is not the same level of focus on agents' commissions. And they're no higher or lower in other industries than they are in football. Football is just, it's just one sport out of many. So who exactly is opposing the agents' right to earn a fee? It's not coming from players. You know, hands up here. I work for the PFA. I teach for the PFA. I teach for the League Managers Association. Um, I sit in the canteen at lunchtime and I listen to what they're talking about. I've never heard anybody moan about agents' fees. So... Who exactly is FIFA trying to work on behalf of? Because if you take a look at the stakeholders in the game, if the players are happy, if the managers are happy, when I talk to chief executives, what's come across when I was researching the book was uh, I had a long interview with, with one Premier League chief executive, and he said, we were in a position four or five years ago where we had a player who'd come through the academy really good player. And the player found out that he was on less money than some of his compatriots. Now, we didn't think that was a huge issue at the time because we, we weren't aware that the player was unhappy about it. The player, however, would find it very intimidating at the age of you know, 23, 24, and you're not necessarily financially confident or financially savvy to go into the office of a 50-year-old experienced executive and say, I think I'm getting a raw deal here. Um, so the player has a word with the agent. The agent phoned up the chief executive. The chief executive said, absolutely, we understand your client's position. We want the player to stay. So they all had a meeting together. The player was given a pay rise, given a two-year extension on his contract, which meant that the club got security in terms of the reduction in the likelihood of the player leaving on a Bosman. All of the parties went away from that meeting very satisfied. The club got additional security and they had a happier employee. A happier employee is a more productive employee. The player now felt that he was being paid what he was worth and the agent had acted as the intermediary between the two parties and had earned the commission that the club said, we're quite happy because compared to what it would have cost us to replace that player in the market if he had left under Bosman. So who exactly are FIFA acting on behalf of? On that point, Kieran, we know that with the Court of Arbitration of Sport decision, that went FIFA's way, and recent decisions, including the Rule K arbitration in England, went the way of four agencies, but we'll say the agents, and there were other decisions that went for the agents, at least of injuncting parts of the FIFA football agent regulations. Right now, we're in a bit of a stalemate. Do you think there are any key observations or realisations from a finance perspective that need to be made to either the agents or FIFA in this dispute? That may change the direction of the dispute, considering that now possibly FIFA is waiting for a European Court of Justice decision. What's your view on how you think this dispute may be settled down the track? Well, I'm quite friendly with a number of sports lawyers, and they say that mediation is always better than confrontation. Um, trying to work out FIFA's motives in all of this, because it doesn't care about the welfare of players, as we've seen with the expansion of its own competitions. It doesn't appear to particularly care about fans as a stakeholder group, given the prices it's charging and complications for fans who want to attend tournaments, because now you have to travel ridiculous distances between matches and so on. So why FIFA are targeting the agents is, is a strange one, but clearly they see it as a useful diversion get people around the table. And if FIFA can persuade those from the agent side of the negotiations that a cap of X or Y is appropriate, I'm sure the agents will listen because most people are very reasonable. I think what FIFA are right. asking for, to me, looks unreasonable. I paid the agent for my book 10%. I was absolutely delighted. They taking 10% of a decent number is better than me getting 100% of nothing. And so I don't understand what they're trying to achieve by dragging this out. 
um, when there will be individual jurisdictions which will make this very difficult for FIFA to get their views over the line. And the agents are quite smart. I, mean, I know when I attended the court for arbitration for sport, that they couldn't even get my name right. And they didn't know the difference between dollars and pounds. And I was quite staggered at the lack of professional research and background history that had been undertaken by FIFA's legal team. In France, we've got a cap of 10%. That's obviously state law. In a lot of major league American sports, agents have got a cap of 3%, which comes from obviously collective bargaining agreements and player agent associations. If FIFA managed to get a very positive decision in the European Court of Justice where the proposed cap on agent fees was to be implemented, how do you think this will impact football finance and also change the behaviour of clubs, agents and, of course, players? Well, as part of my research for the CAS hearing, I downloaded the financial statements of a number of agents firms and they're not making a lot of money. So if you reduce income streams, A, you, I think, reduce the attractiveness of people wanting to join the industry, which will have an impact upon the quality of the service being offered. B, you run the risk of disaffected players um, and also players being exploited because the common narrative is that the hedge funds, the sovereign wealth funds, the billionaires that own football clubs, they're the victims in all of this. And it's the big bad agents and the horrible players who are exploiting them. And I'm going, well, I, I, I don't know too many victims who are billionaires. You know, it's, it's, it seems a bit strange that to me. I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't get to being billionaires by helping a little old ladies across the road. And to say that they are the wronged parties in all of this is uh, very strange. I don't think it will smooth things. Um, I think it will reduce the number of people wanting to enter the agent's industry because people will just say, yeah, we've got the exam. And, yeah, I'm in favour of the exams. Uh, having a qualitative threshold is beneficial to any profession. But when it comes to earning money, there's not a cap on players' earnings. There's not a cap on chief executives' earnings. There's not a cap on Gianni Infantino's earnings. So targeting the agents just seems to be a bit of an anachronism. And I think it, I can't see the benefits to the industry. Yes, there will be talk of, well, there's less money leaking out of the football industry, but where is it leaking to? If it's leaking more into dividends for private equity firms, I, I don't see how football benefits. Talking about the cap, is there any financial economic modelling or accounted wizardry that can be used to establish maybe a pro rata cap or a quantifiable cap on ageing commissions rather than just guesswork and random figures, as currently seems to be the case with FIFA proposal having a 10, a 6, a 3 within their framework? Is there any, I would say, research or economic modelling or accounting modelling that can be done to really get a cap which seems reasonable based on financial principles? Well, if you look at, at maximum pricing, and that's what we are talking about here, if you apply maximum pricing models to any economic environment, then you get one of two things happening. If the maximum price is set below the market price, then you have people leaving the industry, whether that's a supplier. You know, that could be looking at the agricultural products. If you're a farmer, it could be electrical goods. And it's the same for labour services. So if you set the cap at too low a figure, what you will have is a change and you'll have a shortage of quality products being available to the consumer. Here, the consumer is the player and the consumer is also the club. You know, people forget about that. All of the focus tends to be, why shouldn't the players be paying for it all? If the cap is set too high, you know, if you set a cap of 30% and the average the industry is you know, at 6, 8, 10, then it has no impact. So it, it just becomes a paper tiger. You know, it's a titular cap and it has no impact on the market. Um, with regards to FIFA and the numbers that it's proposing, they do appear to be plucked completely from thin air. I'm not aware of any academic research. And you know, that's what we do at university. You know, we do nerdy things, which the rest of society thinks, well, I'd rather leave that to somebody else. Um, and there's no evidence of a cap at the levels that FIFA have been suggesting would improve the market. And, and by improving the market, um, you know, the market involves players either renegotiating contracts or having an advisory to renegotiate those contracts for them, or fluidity in the market in moving from Club X to Club Y. And I'm not denying that there are challenges given the monies involved and also the perhaps the more 
cavalier approaches taken in some countries. Again, yeah, I, I know one chief executive went to sign a player from South America and there were 10 different parties claiming to be the player's agent and the player didn't seem to know himself. So, you know, do things need to be tidied up? Yes. But in terms of setting a market rate, I can't see any justification for the numbers that FIFA appears to have arrived at. We know that clubs, especially in Europe, have to look at UEFA rules. There's discussion of anchoring or some type of mechanism coming into the English Premier League. So the clubs and the amount they spend, including agent commissions, is going to be probably more restrictions. Do you think those pressures, which aren't really caps, will hurt the agent's earning model in future? That not so much the FIFA caps, but it's the club's behaviour going forward? Um, in relation to the wage caps, there is an issue in terms of the acceleration of wages within the industry. Now, I've used the word issue. I've deliberately not used the word problem. If we take a look at the Premier League, for example, since it started in 1992-93, revenues are up by 2,800% and wages are up by 3,800%, which has meant that from a financial point of view, the majority of clubs are loss making. How can they reduce those losses? Well, they can address overall player costs. And I think it is noticeable that within the definition of UEFA's soft wage cap, which is coming in you know, at 90, 80, 70%, agents' commissions were included within that total. And also with this anchoring idea of the club who finishes bottom, you can't spend more than you know four and a half times or five times that club's broadcast income and um, what could be broadcast and commercial you know, then that will be an interesting one to work out because once again it will be players wages plus amortization of transfer fees plus impairments of player wages plus impairments of transfer fees and agents fees gets crowbarred into the equation because it's politic to do so so that would have a negative impact upon the overall redistribution of wealth, of which agents are one of the stakeholders in the game. Most agents, pretty much all agents we know, including me and Jonathan, are against obviously the capping of agent commissions. We collectively, me and Jonathan, propose an auditing mechanism as an alternative to FIFA to avert any capping of commissions. And what we mean by that is that anything over a certain amount, say 10 12% that's paid in an agent fee, FIFA can audit the paperwork, look at the club, what's that they've provided, the player and the agent to see if that deal has been voluntarily agreed to or and there's been some other things happening in the background. Do you think that's a plausible idea where they're just looking at auditing and checking and compliance with fees that look astronomical may have been a better way than capping everything? Yes, because to a certain extent, you're evidencing the work that you've done. And you know that applies in all industries. I'm currently buying myself an apartment and things have got complicated. So the solicitor who I'm using, another word solicitor, is my agent, you know, person who's negotiating the deal on my behalf. They said, look, Kieran, it's going to cost you a few more quid because I'm having to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, OK, let's take a look at what you're doing. Yeah, I absolutely understand it. I know who the clowns and the idiots are in this particular equation, and it's clearly not you. And I have no issue. And I don't think any party have. And if you have trust in the level of the professional service being offered to you, whilst you know, none of us want to pay out more money, but you accept. You know, if, if I go to a doctor or a dentist or a physio, it's going to cost me money. If I've got a private health scheme, which I haven't, I'm a, I'm a lefty teacher, but it's going to cost me more money and you accept that as such. As something that's already been mentioned by you guys and something very recent and ultimately still to be discussed, never mind agreed. In recent weeks, there were those proposals from the English Premier League for new PSR, Profit and Sustainability Regulations, albeit seemingly as somewhat of a backstop anchoring mechanism for cost controls. Now, agent commissions, as you pointed out, were reportedly part of those cost controls. However, correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard that there are some question marks over which agent payments are and aren't applicable. So from what you know thus far, because I know you'll be watching these developments like a hawk, which elements of agent commissions do you understand are applicable? As far as I understand, it would be the cost to the club. So that would be presumably for renegotiation of contracts, um, extension of contracts, and the cost of bringing the player to Club X from Club Y or, or vice versa. Um, so the relationship between the player and agent would be excluded from these totals. 
Heron, your favorite financial word is amortization. Mm -hmm. Even here in Australia, and we have that term, obviously, in the accounting standards and principles. Can you explain amortization in a nutshell and how it specifically relates to and impacts on agent commissions and payments? Or is it relevant to when clubs do their assessment on all the costs, including agent commissions and payments? Right. When a club signs a player, the total cost of bringing that player to the club, which will include agent fees, anything which you pay to bring the player to the club is capitalized. So, so what we do is say, if I sign a player for $100 million, and that includes a $10 million agent fee, I've got a cost of $100 million, which I've got to go somewhere into my accounts. Let's say that player signed a five-year contract. So I could go and say, well, it's going to cost me $100 million this year and nothing for the next four years. Well, that's dumb, isn't it? I'm going to get the benefit of the player's services for five years. So what amortization does, it simply says, this is the cost of bringing the player to the club, 100 million bucks. It's a five-year contract. You divide one figure by the other. And what we're effectively saying, it's a bit like renting the player. So think of amortization as a proxy for rent. Instead of buying the player, you're renting the player from the other club for $20 million a year. Why are agents fees included in that? It's the same as legal fees. It's the same as you know the cost of the player having a medical transport, private jets being employed to bring the player to the destination club and so on. Those are the rules in respect of all assets. And that's just sort of standard accounting practice. What we saw and the reason why I think the word amortization became trending on Twitter, which was probably a career high mark in my life uh, as somebody that's been teaching accounting since the 1980s, is that Chelsea started to offer longer contracts. And the benefits to this is that if you sign that player for 100 million bucks on an eight-year contract, 100 divided by eight gives you a cost of $12.5 million a year instead of 20. So the amortization cost is deemed to be part of the overall overheads of running the football club. All of a sudden, what we have now is a lower cost going through into the accounts, and therefore that's allowed Chelsea to sign more players. Now, we mentioned the sharing of commissions, especially at the top level as advisors or agencies from different countries involved in deals. In terms of your research and your experience, do you see agent-related finances treated differently in different places around the world? And if you have, what are the biggest differences you've noted in terms of that treatment of agent-related finances? Um, I think you notice a different cultural approach rather than the financial approach. Um, some jurisdictions are far more relaxed and there's less hostility towards agents. And in some countries, agents are used on a more common basis for general business transactions than they are in others. So that therefore there tends to be a more benign attitude towards them. So yeah, the culture of hostility towards agencies has come very much from mainstream media because it's easy. And Eric Hall is still used as an example of agent excess. And yet I didn't see his clients ever complaining about him. They were absolutely delighted because he'd negotiate deals for them for issues that which they weren't even aware of and on which the club would have made a 100% return on the intellectual property that the players were foregoing. So it's an industry whose reputations very much vary from country to country. And therefore, that tends to dictate the approach taken by legislators, by media and other stakeholders in the game. And on the topic of reputation, just to close, Kieran, from a finance and accounting perspective, how can you see the behaviour of agents changing over the next few years and also how clubs and players interact with agents? Are there signs of any real problems and new skullduggery from your perspective, either from agents or football as a whole on agent-related matters? I know you probably don't want to hear this. Your service providers. Now, in exactly the same way as the people that provide the transport, the people that provide the pies, you know, the consultants who are employed in respect of a new marketing campaign. And what I think there will be is perhaps a flight towards quality. Um, some agencies do have better reputations than others. I know that, and you will know this far better than I do, some chief executives will take the view that we will only deal with agency X very much as a last resort. And that's not in the best interests of players. Um, I think it would be beneficial if there was some sort of qualitative kite mark or the players union itself you know, takes heed of its members to report any wrongdoings. 
What I do anticipate seeing, and this is more from the non-agency position, is that the increased layers of rules which are likely to come from anchoring new arrangements with UEFA in terms of cost control, the increased pressure put on the industry by the ECA, who is trying to extract more money for the elite clubs, is that every rule introduced, there will be a loophole and agents will get caught up in that, whether they choose to or not, because agents won't necessarily be the problem. The problem or the issue will be the accountants and lawyers who will be looking for soft spots in new rules, which may impact agents. But I don't think the agents will be driving that conversation themselves. And on that, Kieran, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us. We both appreciate how busy you are with so many media requests from the likes of Sky, the BBC and many others. Plus, you've got your university duties and the price of football and the world of football finance is constantly pitching curveballs in your direction nowadays. Best wishes to Kevin and Guy on the price of football and, of course, most importantly to the Baroness and Finlay. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for the invite, Guy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Take care now. Cheers. And we are so grateful to Kieran for agreeing to spend some time with us to discuss football finance and various agent-related matters. I've known Kieran for several years, even before he wrote his Price of Football book and started the Price of Football podcast. We regularly share notes, ideas and thoughts on matters when the topics of agents and football finance collide. As although interrelated at times, both are quite nuanced and specialist subject areas. But I must just say, Kieran is one of the nicest, most genuine, honest, yet forthright at times people on Football Matters, who not only really knows his stuff from a financial perspective, but he truly cares about the fabric of football, the people in it, and the role it plays far beyond just football finance. So we've packaged Kieran safely in a crate with a fresh supply of spring water, quinoa and tofu, and returned him in one piece to the price of football by recorded delivery. Yes, Jonathan, a fantastic guest, a fantastic insight by probably the top world finance guy in Kieran, who also understands the agent's work and how fees and commission work and how they are treated within clubs. I will say this, that the big 510 agencies are making money, but have got huge overhead salaries and expenses. They have lawyers, accountants, scouts, office administrators, marketing sponsorship, business development, and they also got shareholders who need to maybe pay a dividend. And Kieran pointed out to us that he looks a lot at the UK company's house. He does that for his research in clubs, finances, and how they're treating all their revenue and expenses, etc. But also some of the bigger agencies have financial reports on there as well. So for anyone interested, that might be something intriguing to look at. I will say this, and Kieran, I think, would agree that smaller or solo agent finances are struggling much more now. It's just the way the business is, and it's just based on you know what player portfolio you have, um, the sharing of fees, because they have to share fees with other agents, and there's just not enough deals in a lot of countries, especially outside the big five. In essence, for me, Kieran understands the big club transfer business And he also understands the demand for agents. And I researched a quote that he gave in a recent article. He mentioned, to a certain extent, clubs are prepared to do whatever it takes to recruit the talent they're looking for. And if this results in having to pay substantial agent fees, the attitude of many clubs is, so be it. And, you know, if a top agent is working for an elite player or a selling club or a buying club in a single deal, then, you know, those top agents can make good money. And that's not just from the club, but also commission on player wages and personal sponsorship deals. I think it's important to mention that although Chelsea got another mention today when speaking with Kieran, it was just a total coincidence. We don't have an agenda against Chelsea. It's just the way agent related stories have fallen in recent times. And the way things are rumoured to be developing, many other clubs may well come under the spotlight on agent-related matters in the not-too-distant future. Not least, and rather worryingly, for me at least, the club I've supported all my life. But another thing that Kieran mentioned was in regards to the dispute over the FFAR and his comments about mediation being better than confrontation. And whilst I, rather unsurprisingly, fully support that sentiment from Kieran, and I swear I didn't bribe him in a way to promote the concept of mediation in relation to football disputes, the FFAR dispute, 
and I think I've said this before on the show, in my capacity as a professional mediator, I don't think mediation would ever have worked in that particular dispute over the several years it has now been going on. And that question was actually posed at the Law in Sport football conference in London last week, which was a great event, I have to say. And if you missed it, I think there will be another one next year, plus they have events going on throughout the year. But as I said, at the conference itself, when the question was asked, for mediation to be effective, all parties to the dispute need to enter into the process in good faith with an aim to resolve that dispute. And at no time have I observed all the key parties to the FFAR dispute demonstrate such good faith, whether it be the agents or FIFA. But enough on disputes in football, not least FFAR and the applicability of mediation, maybe a topic for a future episode of the agent's angle, although not too sure how interested people would be in that. So without further delay, the moment some have probably been waiting for, not least Peter, here we go with the now regular feature of Quick Kicks. (laughs) Um, now it's time for quick takes, not quick kicks. And this is a segment that we look at key agent trends, peculiar deals from around the world and some updates. Quick picks number one, going to South Africa, Mamelodi Sundowns and former coach of theirs, a coach by the name of Pizzo, signed a contract at a hospital parking lot. Now his agent is his wife, Mira Tagale. And now there's a battle, a bit of battle between Mama Lodi and her firm, MT Sports. And because Pizzo has, after a couple of months, I think, or maybe more than that, went to probably the biggest club in Egypt, Al Ali, and left Mama Lodi Sundowns, also a huge club in South Africa, there's a dispute in the High Court in Johannesburg in South Africa. It's a very bitter dispute because he left the club and the Sundowns are demanding compensation from the agent about 8.6 million rand. And it's interesting that the agent, being his wife, has basically said that because she's a female football agent, this is in the article, that they have mistreated her from day one in terms of negotiation and what's going on in this dispute. And she also mentions that in a rush for him to get a job, he didn't have the lawyers, he didn't have her there in order to negotiate. And some of the terms that were in the contract were very unreasonable. And I'll just mention a couple of them that in this contract that allegedly Pizzo signed with the Mamelodi Sundowns, they wanted him, or one of the goals was, to win every league match, to lift the African Champions League or the CAF Champions League every season and win one of the three domestic cups. And his wife, as the agent, said that's impossible. So this is a bit of a messy situation, Jonathan, but fascinating what happens and what can we say, the pressure of signing a deal. Quick pick two, Lionel Messi napkin sells for one million in auction, but there's a twist. That's the name of one of the articles. So the famous napkin, which officially heralded the start of Lionel Messi's association with FC Barcelona, has sold at an auction. One million is a collector's item. It dates back to 2000 when his father, Ortega Messi, agreed to allow his 13-year-old son to join Barca. And this napkin or handkerchief uh, contained a few signatures, including the Barcelona director of football, Carlos Recax at the time, and also a football agent, Horacio Gagoli. Now, Horacio Gagoli had this napkin in his possession for two decades or more, and he's the one that sold it. But there was another advisor who signed the napkin, and that was Jose Minguela. And there's a bit of a dispute about that. So it's probably the most expensive napkin in the world, but fascinating that agents, again, it doesn't always have to be the contract, will sign something. And in this case, probably one of the most important napkins in the world. Quick pick three. This is more of a trend. I did some research and I saw some research on LinkedIn and I would say university lecturer, Dr. Abdul Rahman Badwan has provided some thoughts in future about agents involved in trends and how football will involve by 2050 or maybe earlier. And he mentions that AI is going to have obviously a big impact. It's going to drive scouting algorithm that identifies emerging talents. And probably that's going to happen sooner. The interesting one is going to be virtual tryouts of players showcasing the skills in a virtual environment. And the other one is blockchain. We know about blockchain contracts, but those digital contracts will be more prevalent in the future, which is going to be quite interesting, Jonathan. So interesting that agents will have to transition down the track with certain other AI and other developments. And finally, quick pick four, an unusual one. 
especially for the agent who did this deal, if he did it on behalf of the club. And we mentioned Chelsea again, Jonathan. Eden Hazard, Chelsea are getting £5 million from an Eden Hazard bonus deal. Even though he retired, this bonus term was in a transfer from Chelsea to Real Madrid and is still valid even though from his retirement. This happened in, I believe, 2019, $130 million package that Hazard signed at the time. So Chelsea received five million bonus post retirement from that deal because the Spaniards reached the Champions League final, and that was one of the metrics in that contract. And that happened seven months after Mr. Hazard retired. So that's quite interesting. It's a trigger, and I will say the agent, if it was an agent who was involved or a football lawyer who put that in, there you go, Chelsea. That five million will help obviously with you know the budget and also with any fair play rules, etc. You know, so planning your contract is very important. Putting these some of these interesting clauses in really can affect the deal. But that's quick takes for today, Jonathan. Any thoughts? After last week, you do know I'm going to deliberately get the name wrong of this feature every week for as long as I can, don't you? If only to wind you up. I think on the Chelsea one, that's intriguing as demonstration. Whoever working on behalf of Chelsea, whether it be one of their execs or whether it be an agent acting in the transfer, I think they deserve a pat on the back. If you're getting a commission into your clients, even after the player has ceased to play, that's a fantastic bit of work. But I'm desperately trying to find out how many napkins I've actually had signed by clients for the future. Yes, um, but look, you know, it's for us fascinating the world of agents. It just brings these stories, these trends, these little nuances. And, you know, when sometimes it takes is a notice board of what's happening out there and just to inform agents on matters that concern our industry. And before we bring this episode of The Agents Angle to a close, there was a big story we wanted to bring to you this week from the football agents world. However, it is such a big story with quite a lot of aspects we want to look at and things agents, players and clubs should be aware of. But rather than overload this episode or cut some of the valuable insights from Kieran, we intend to bring you that feature, all being well in the next episode. And in a similar vein, for some weeks now, we have asked for your questions in regards to agent-related matters. And it is our plan to also, in the next episode, try and answer some of those questions that we've already received. So if you have a question with regards to the football agent world, regulations or other related matters, please do send them in ASAP to questions at theagentsangle.com or via the LinkedIn page or even post them to the listing for this episode on Spotify. And and this will allow us to try and answer them before we take a summer break in an attempt to recharge our batteries for what we think is going to be a very busy latter part of 2024 in relation to football agent matters. And who knows, after that summer break, the FIFA football agent register may actually be fixed and back online. Yes, well, hopefully we can get that register back online because a lot of people have been asking who are the licensed agents and um, just want to have a look at that. But before we close, there are actually two upcoming conferences in the latter part of this year. Football Legal are hosting a football legal conference in Yaoundé, Cameroon between the 17th and 8th of June 2024. They're covering training compensation, transfers, contracts and minors. I don't know if it's French and English. I think it'd probably be both languages. But for those in that region or in Africa, that's a very interesting conference. And I'm on the editorial committees for Football Legal. I do contribute articles to that periodical. And I would say I do have top line speakers and football lawyers. So that's something to look out for. Also, the seminal day. Danish football conference is back between the 14th and 16th of December at Bronby Stadium. So the Danish football conference, which goes on every year, very interesting, especially from a talent perspective. And just in one hour ago, the Civil Court of Buenos Aires has decided a request for provisional measures filed by a group of Argentinian agents against the FIFA FFAR, ordering the suspension of several provisions. The court found that these several provisions, and I don't know which one they are because I don't have that detail, um, infringe rights recognised by the Argentinian constitution and would threaten competition amongst national agents. So another court case, and this time in South America and Argentina, a huge market. We'll probably have to chase that up. Don't know much information on it. It's obviously just happened an hour ago. And also, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but a lot of our listeners who took the FIFA exam will get their results. So we're hoping they get positive results and all the best. So that's it from me. Bye.
Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what those pass rates are for this third sitting. But as we said, strap yourselves in, folks. We mentioned silly season is almost upon us and the summer is already interesting and exciting, if not frustrating from an agent's perspective. And when the transfer window starts to reopen, that will become even more evident. So until the next episode of The Agent's Angle, please do take care and bye for now. The purpose of the Agents Angle podcast is to provide news, information and facilitate discussion on regulatory matters, policies, business trends and issues affecting football agents worldwide. The opinions and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only and should never be considered legal or professional advice. Furthermore, the views expressed by guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Thank you for listening.